Welcome to Getting Heated, the place to debate and discuss all things surf related. There's been some drama surrounding the Australian leg of the tour, so we're hitting it head on with opinions that won't please everyone. And in an unpredictable season, how many events need to be held for a world title to be truly earned? Plus, is Julian Wilson Australia's best hope for a championship? Or is he past his time? Finally, we're going deep into the system that develops future talent on tour. Let's start some heats. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Getting Heated, the place for discussion, debate, and disputes on all things surf-related. I'm Dave Prodan, here temporarily moderating the true stars of the show, Australia's Mick Fanning and Hawaii's Ross Williams. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Mick, looks like you got a little bit of color. Mate, it feels like I've lived under the sun for the last week. The waves have been incredible here on the Goldie. Dave, your beard looks majestic. Yeah, not quite as tan. The waves haven't been the same here in California. Well, the whole point of getting heated is to take the debates we're having offline and put them out into the world, controversial or not. And recently, there's been no shortage of buzz surrounding the upcoming Australian leg of the championship tour. So we're going to dive into that for the opening exchange in Heat 1. Recently, the local Australian community of Lennox Head was divided on a proposal to bring the championship tour to their area this April, ultimately resulting in the council declining the permit for the world's best surfers to compete there. So here's the heat one question. Who loses out the most with the WSL not going to Lennox Head? Ross, what's your take on this? This is point blank, uh, without a doubt, the surfers. The surfers miss out on this one, especially this year with COVID. You know, we're trying to be nimble. Nothing's, you know, totally locked in. So to have Lennox pulled from the schedule is just a big crush. You know, there's there's obviously other point breaks on the schedule, but Lennox has more power, which I really love, compared to, say, the Goldie or even Bells. Um, it's just a high quality wave. The backup spots are epic, you know, so it sounds like there was a lot of complaints from the locals down there. So I would consider this a win for them. And as you know, Mick, the locals are always going to have a, a bit of a win. You know, it's not that fun for them to have a big event show up with every single pro surfer and all the media. Um, it's not that fun for anyone. Take it from me who lives and grew up on the North Shore. You know, we have to deal with it for a couple months out of the year. Um, but the surfers are the ones that are going to uh, miss out on just absolutely, anytime you can rip uh, with a jersey on, which Lennox would provide, you know, that that's that's what you want. Yeah, Ross, I, I think the local community is the ones that missed out the most. Um, obviously, you, you spoke about COVID. COVID's really affected everywhere. Um, you know, Lennox is not far south of the border, and with the border closures between New South Wales and Queensland, they're not getting the influx of, of tourists that they would have. Um, but also, too, there's there's a whole group of kids that are coming up in that area that would have just thrived on a, an event like this. You know, you've got Jai Glinderman, who just won under-18 stab surfer of the year. Like, that's a huge feat. Uh, he's got a mate down there, Mikey Madonna, who would have done incredible in these waves. Uh, and then you've got a bunch of local guys that are living there, uh, Owen Wright, Connor O'Leary. You know, it would have been great for the whole community to get behind these surfers and just really give them a push. And, and really, you know, get that hometown grown feeling would have, would have been incredible. Um, also, to the the community as a whole has has taken a few hits over the years. You know, pardon the pun, but you know, there's been a lot of shark attacks in that area. So tourism isn't up down there. Tourism is down. So you know. To have this influx of people come in just for two weeks, it's two weeks out of the year. You know, Byron's just up the road. It's not like no one knows about where Ballon Atlantic is. Um, so, you know, just would have helped the community, would have helped the restaurants, would have helped the the tourism industry just grow a little bit and shine a brighter light on Ballon rather than that dark shark stigma that Ballon Lennox area has. Lennox is a premium wave. So in a year like 2021, where we need to be nimble and sort of flexible and, and be ready to just have events where we can, you know, the surfers are just gutted right now that Lennox got pulled. Yeah, look, Lennox is a hundred times better wave than Newcastle. I think everyone can agree on that. And look, we've all dealt with crowds around events and they only last for a couple of weeks. Lennox, I go down there all the time and it's not getting any less crowded, even with the grumpy locals around. You know, and there's a lot of great people down there, like speaking to some friends, you know, to have their, be able to take their kids and just watch the best surfers at their home break is 
there's nothing like it. You know, I was a kid once growing up on the Gold Coast and, you know, I, I used to get you, I actually got your autograph once, Ross. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's that community would just, just thrive on that area if it happened. But also too, the WSL sort of got painted in a bad brush saying that they would have come in and ruined the environmental side of it. The WSL leaves their events so pristine and they do such a great job of making sure that the, the environment is so looked after. So I'm, I'm sort of bummed that they went down that route as well. Well, Lennox is out. Newcastle is in. And I think before we touch down in Australia, there may be a few more changes, which will be exciting. When we return, we'll get into the topics of world title determination during an unpredictable season. And we'll be debating Australia's next true hope for a championship. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Getting Heated. I'm Dave Prodan, joined by legends of the surfing world and now the surfing hot takes world, Ross Williams and Mick Fanning. Well, 2021 is nothing if not unpredictable at the moment, and the way it's shaping up this year's championship tour leads us to Heat 2. The season's already seen the cancellation of Sunset Beach and the postponement of Santa Cruz. If 2021 turns out to be an abbreviated season, what is the minimum number of events needed to legitimately crown the men's and women's world champions? Mick, as a three-time world champ yourself, start us off. Yeah, look, Dave, it's a tricky one, especially in the world that we're in right now. Um, you know, I just love seeing events. In saying that, though, I would love to see at least seven to eight. Um, I feel like five is probably a little, little too small. I don't feel like people catch on fire. Um, some people are ironing out the kinks. Uh, and then if we go back to um, when CJ Hobgood won, people felt like there was a bit of an asterisk on that one. Uh, even CJ himself has come out and said, look, I, I didn't feel like I actually won because it was such an abbreviated season. Being a surfer, you do look in and you go, well, he did win, but we'd love to see just a few more events just to iron out some unlucky things here and there. So look, for me, seven to eight events would be perfect. Yeah, I'm going to disagree, Mick. Um, and, and I do, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's always, um, you know, almost every single year. And, and, you know, here's, here's a funny one. Even with Italo last year, I'd, I would love to put an asterisk on his world title just because John got hurt after smashing the first four events. So there's always going to be something kind of funky that either goes your way or does not go your way. As you mentioned, Mick, we're in extreme times right now. I mean, it is just the funkiest year, year and a half now closing in on ever with the, all the travel restrictions with this pandemic. So um, I don't think that we should just go all the way to funky town and just crown a world champion with one or two events. Um, I do think we have to have some sort of uh, limit. Um, I would even be happy with four, four or five. Um, and then, you know, this also sort of is a great year to have an abbreviated season because we are testing the waters on sort of that Super Bowl event at lowers where we're going to crown the champion, whether you like it or not, with one event. So this is the year of getting hot and, you know, getting hot quick. Um, otherwise, you're going to be left in the dust. It's not as about grinding out this long, consistent year. Um, you know, it's about being nimble, being fresh, and being on top of it. Yeah, you talk about asterisks there. You know, obviously, John came out firing last year. But then also, too, do you put another asterisk next to Gabe Medina as well, where he just had a meltdown in Portugal? He was on his way to win his third as well. So, look, we could get the pens out and start drawing all over the board. But, um, look... I want to see more more events and if we can get there can get to seven or eight that would be incredible i would rather see a world champion based on four or five events than not um and i, I think that's just what we're dealing with right now and then fast forward 2022 hopefully we're back to normal mick the subject of world champions brings us straight into heat three The Australian women have absolutely dominated the championship tour with Lane Beachley, Chelsea Hedges, Stephanie Gilmore, and Tyler Wright winning an incredible 15 of the last 20 world titles. But on the men's side, the lucky country hasn't had an Australian title holder since getting heated star Mick Fanning in 2013. But there have been plenty of challengers. So for Heat 3, the question is, is the Sunshine Coast's Julian Wilson still Australia's best hope for a world champion, or will it be up to the younger generation to take over? Ross, open this up. 
Okay, here's my disclaimer. Uh, I don't think Julian is washed up and he's going to fade away into like 20th spot. Um, that being said, Dave, your question was, uh, is he the favorite to win the world title out of all the Aussies on tour? I'm going to say no. Um, I, I'm going to take the youth here. I think, uh, you know, I'm heavily back in Ethan Ewing and especially Jack Robinson. I think of maybe something that's affecting Julian the last few years is his mindset. You know, he's had a lot of frustrating results and he seems to go dark a little more than your average pro on tour it seems to like you know sit heavy on his shoulders you know when you're on tour for 10 or 12 years that sort of stuff is it creates scar tissue and i feel like that's julian's uh nemesis not his talent i love the way julian surfs you know he rips in in heavy waves and in performance but i, I think if i had to choose julian over ethan and jack i'm going to take the Broms. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you here, Ross. I think Julian's still our biggest hope. Um, the reason why is because, you know, he's been, out of the 10 years he's been on tour, he's won in all different types of conditions, from Chopu to France, Portugal, Hawaii. You know, he can win in any different arena. When he catches fire, he can beat the world's best. He pushed Gabe Medina all the way to the last heat. He's not scared to get in a tussle with anyone and, you know, get down and dirty. You know, even though he's my boy, I still believe him. And I think that, you know, the next couple of years are going to be really crucial for him to uh, really fire. And with the younger guys, I, I feel like they still haven't got the runs on the board. You know, Ethan had one really shaky year on tour, still hasn't won an event. Jack Robbo, exceptional talent, still needs a, a bit of work when it comes to small wave surfing. So, look, I feel like keep those guys, we'll keep grooming those guys to get, um, you know, to that level, but I still feel like they're a few years off and I still feel like Julian's got some left in the tank. Mm. It's an interesting one, Mick, because, uh, you know, if you look at the most recent events, um, the youngsters have a leg up on Julian, especially Jack. Jack has Julian's number right now. Uh, Jack smoked Julian at pipe, 17.73 uh, to, to, to Julian's 10 points. That's a big deal. I know Jack is known to rip at pipe, but so is Julian. And so for him to to get one on him there is pretty gnarly. Jack uh, also got him over on a Goldie event. Um, I know it wasn't a full field event, but um, that was a pretty big deal to me. And I watched that heat actually this morning back and it was a really solid heat from Jack and waves that Jack is not known for. Some of those um, weak weaknesses that we've been kind of talking about with Jack, small waves, his speed and, and pop and everything was all really relevant there um, on, you know, on small waves at Cabarita. And he, he, he took Julian out. Ethan smashed that event also. You know, Ethan is really, to me, he's the sleeper. You know, if he gets good at places like Pipe and Chopo, look out, that guy could win. You know, he could be the next Mick Fanning, I think. You know, he's just so, so talented and everyone knows that. Um, but Jack right now, I would say, is, is, is really well-rounded. And the Groms, you know, over the last few events, they, they do kind of have one up on Julian. Yeah, look, uh, this is perfect. I think putting a B in Julian's bonnet is exactly what he needs. Um, you know, I think, he, as you mentioned, those two heats that he had versus Jack, he didn't look great. Um, and I think he's gone back to the drawing board. I think he's going to work there and, and really dissect what he needs to improve on. Then you have the Super Bowl event at Trestles. You can't argue that Julian Wilson is not a huge threat if it comes to trestles. He's got it all. He's got airs, he's got big turns. And as I said, he's got the grit to go for it. Yeah. I, one more thing I want to just add, Mick. The Groms have eyes this big. Their energy is so high right now. And they're, you know, they're basically rookies. I think that enthusiasm is going to, you know, give the edge to the Groms. I'm going to disagree with you there again. First event at Newcastle. Last time there was an event at Newcastle, Julian fired right up. You know, he is living there now. He loves a hometown advantage. He loves the support of his crew. So, look, I think he's going to fire up and he's going to come in strong for the rest of 2021. I like it. More bees in Julian's bonnets. When we return, we're going deep into the system that develops future world champs. But the question is, is it working for all regions across the board? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Getting Heated. Mick and Ross, you guys have hashed out some sticky topics today. Are you ready to go deep on the final topic of the episode? Mick? Yeah, I'm going to lather up some more sunscreen and get, get in there, mate. Bring it on, Dave. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. 
Developing future talent is a critical part of professional surfing. Every sporting league, including the WSL, has a system that scouts and sharpens the skills of future world champs. But when it comes to surfing, the system in the past few years has radically transformed the world title landscape with Brazilian males applying themselves with huge force lately compared to the previous decades of competition. So the going deep question is, what is the main driver that has sidelined the Australian and American title contenders in recent years? Mick, the floor is yours. Yeah, look, Dave, I'm just going to speak on behalf of Australia here. I feel like we're, we're missing a big link out of the chain. We're, growing up, we used to have the, the Billabong Pro Juniors, the Pro Junior Series in Australia. And I felt like that Pro Junior area was exactly where you'd need to get those runs on the boards. You're surfing against some of the best surfers in the world and that confidence of surfing against these older guys and more well-known names when you're a kid just gave you the confidence to go onto the QS and then onto the world tour after that. So that big link is trying to get some sort of system back in Australia where we can really just focus in on, on getting runs on the boards for these guys, getting experience in really heated competition and um, yeah, just building that strength and that confidence within our Australian surfers. For me, it's a pop culture thing more than anything. And in America, for sure, competition in the last 10, maybe even 20 years has sort of taken a backseat to what's cool to the kids. And I think another main driver for that is, is definitely social media. That has become very important. It has become very relevant. And it's brought a lot of these free surfers right up there with world champs. Now you have these Jamie O'Briens and uh, Dane Reynolds and all these people that are some of the best surfers in the world, but they're nowhere near a contest. So. Uh, you know, that motivation has sort of gotten split in half. I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing, but, um, you know, whereas in Brazil, for sure, their focus, I feel like, especially even from their sponsors, is solely driven through competing and winning. Yeah, look, Brazil's regional, you know, domestic tour was incredible. I remember one of the Brazilians telling me he can make more money at home than he could on the on the CT, you know, doing these events. And it was like, wow, that's, that's sort of embarrassing. Um, I feel like when you're talking about the kids going free surfing, especially here in Australia, kids had to go on free surf because there wasn't a, a system for them. There was a block of their time where there was nothing to do. You know, it was either try and figure out how to get on the QS and, and spend all this money or just sit around home and film with your mates. And don't get me wrong, going from, you know, the tour to free surfing, free surfing's hard, man. You have to work really, really hard. So it's not a motivation thing. I think, you know, these free surfers are in surfing incredibly hard and they're coming up with these crazy ideas all the time. Like Mason Howe is one of the most hardworking kids I know. I, I don't think it's a motivation thing. I just think it's not there for them. I think kids might think the easy route is free surfing, but it's totally not. Yeah, I mean, so I think there, this is where you and I disagree a bit because it has so much to do with motivation coming from inspiration. In Hawaii and even the rest of the US, John John winning those couple of world titles, he's responsible for a huge group of kids coming up that are, you know, 10 through 17 years old that are just solely amped on competing and winning because they saw how cool it was for someone like John, who's such an incredible free surfer, focus on winning world titles. And, and that's drawn that motivation and focus back to competing on, on the world tour. So you never know if Ethan Ewing wins a world title, that's gonna spark a lot of interest from um, some of these kids and, and it'll sort of light a fire for that inspiration and that motivation to you know really focus on winning and competing again and, and get sort of taken away from their stupid phone and, and focus on winning here. <laughs> I got, a, I got a quick follow-up question there because the phenomenon we're talking about here is almost split exclusively down the gender line, right? Because we addressed before that Australian women have 15 of the last 20 world titles. Carissa Moore took another four. Why do you think it's, it's specific to, to men in terms of their challenges on, on challenging for a world title from Australia and America? Ross? Men are lazy. <laughs> yeah. I just think they're 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 more susceptible to again 
motivation from social media. It's been so cool to go and free surf and, and do the biggest air possible. Maybe the women are just more psyched on seeing Stephanie Gilmore win all these world titles over the last several years. And they're focused on that. You don't see as many sort of free surf movies being made. Although you are seeing that more recently with women pulling out some really cool free surfing clips. But again, I, I think it's sort of that pop culture so, social media thing that's responsible for the driver. I think the women are doing a great job on the social media side of we are strong, we are going forward. We're, that's that's what I feel. You know, all these women are talking about, you know, equal prize money. Um, you know, we can do it as good as the guys. And it's inspiring these young girls to come and want to be world champions. I think that Carissa Moores, the Stephanie Gilmores and the Tyler Wrights are leading the way in bringing these kids up and pushing them through. I, you know, I have to commend them on the job they do. They, they do an incredible job. Maybe men are more selfish, more lazy, where they just think about themselves, where these women are going out and they're actually doing it for the women's surfing community, which all hats off to them. Yeah, and there, the one other sort of caveat to that whole theory, Mick, is I don't know many free surfers, uh, you know, in women surfing that get just paid to go out there and make movies. You need those surfers that are liberated, that are not boxed in trying to win heats to sort of um, push the envelope. Yeah, we're always going to have those free surfers. There's some people that just can't compete. Dane Reynolds just hated competing. <laughs> All this debate on title talk makes me want the championship tour to come back right now. Before we sign off, we do have something that is absolutely not a debate, which is saving the ocean. And if you haven't already done so, please go now and sign the We Are One Ocean petition. Yeah, it's definitely not a debate, but Dave, go and sign it, people. Let's save our oceans. Get out there. I did it this morning. And, uh, you know, we got to keep our playground clean, you guys. It's, uh, it's our food source. It's everything that we got to take care of the ocean. So anything we can do. Right on. Megan Ross, thank you for signing the petition. Thank you for the show. And we'll see everyone next week. Cheers. Thanks for watching, everyone. Please drop a comment below and tell us what you want us to debate on and Ross will go through, cipher them all, and you might even get a mention on the show.